The people in charge of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant have been investigating a leak inside a reactor building. They suspect water has been escaping from an opening in the containment vessel inside reactor number three. Officials with Tokyo Electric Power Company first discovered the leak on Saturday. A remote-controlled camera captured images of water flowing through the first floor of the reactor building. The officials say the water is highly radioactive. That suggests it's the same water used to cool melted nuclear fuel inside the reactor. TEPCO officials suspect the water is leaking from an opening in the containment vessel that holds a steam pipe. They said extra space around the opening had been tightly sealed with resin. But the material has been exposed to heat from the melted fuel as well as seawater pumped into the vessel immediately after the nuclear accident in March 2011. Officials say the heat and salt water may have deteriorated the resin. TEPCO engineers have been planning to remove the melted fuel from the reactor, a key step toward dismantling the plant. To do that, they need to find out where the containment vessel is damaged and repair it. But they can't enter, enter the reactor building because of high radiation. So they'll look for other ways to address the problem. Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're joined right now by one of the founders of a network of volunteers who came together to map radiation levels throughout Japan after the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown in 2011. They soon realized radiation readings varied widely, with some areas close to the disaster facing light contamination depending on wind and geography, while others much further away showed higher readings. SafeCast volunteers use Geiger counters and open source software to measure the radiation then post the data online for anyone to access. Their effort comes as Japan recently passed a new secrecy bill. Well, for more, we're joined by Peter Franken, who is co-founder of SafeCast. Welcome to Democracy Now! Explain what it is you've done. You're turning smartphones into Geiger counters? Uh, not really uh, that simple. Actually, what happened is after the disaster happened, uh, we were all looking for information. We couldn't find any. Then actually we tried to create a website where we could collect data and share it with people so everybody could know what's happening. And very quickly we found out there was almost no data. The Japanese government had published nothing and we were basically in the dark. Um, after we did that, we, we said we're not going to give up. We had the plan to, to buy lots of Geiger counters, give it to lots of people, and basically use kind of crowdsourcing to get the data and then uh, share the data. Unfortunately, in the first 24 hours after the disaster, almost any Geiger counter on the planet was sold out, so we couldn't get all the equipment to do it. So then we sat down and said, how are we going to solve this problem? How do we uh, uh, get the data out? Then the idea uh, was very simple. We decided to put a Geiger counter on a car connected to a GPS and a computer and start driving around and map the data, very much how Google maps streets. The whole idea was to do the same thing, but then for radiation, and that's how we started. And so take it from there. And we took it from there. And then the first trip we made into Fukushima uh, was an eye-opener. First of all, the radiation levels we, we encountered were way higher than what we had seen on television. Uh, on top of that, we also noticed, as you mentioned, that the, the radiation is not very predictable. It's not the distance to Daiichi that tells you how much radiation there is. It's very blotchy. Nearby, we measured very high and very low. Much further away, we still were measuring high levels of radiation. So as we were talking to people, as we were meeting people, people started to say that, you know, we want to have data about where we're living. And the Japanese government was basically publishing averages for cities. But people are not an average. So people were, are not living in the city hall. They're living in the street. So we decided to focus on measuring every single street as our goal in safe cost. So for the last uh, three years, we have been doing that. And uh, this month, we are passing the 15 million uh, location we have measured. And basically, every street uh, in Japan has been at least measured once, if not many, many more times. 
What's the gadget you've brought in here? Yes, let me, let me show you uh, this. This is um, the system that we're currently using. We have a, a few hundred of these uh, in use by our volunteers. And uh, this uh, is basically a Geiger counter that is in a waterproof and shockproof case. And uh, what happens is the sensor is on the other side. What happens is it's this... It's about the size of a little transistor radio. Yeah, it's more or less it. It's a very small... Four inches device. by, what, five inches by three inches? So, somewhere around yeah. that, yes. And uh, it is designed, the strap goes through the car window, and as you close the car window, the, the thing sits outside of the car, and basically uh, you have to just switch it on and it automatically starts recording the level as you're driving around. And uh, we designed this with lots of volunteers uh, over the last three years, and we went through lots of iterations, and we now are able to... Um, uh, you know, give this to volunteers at a much, much lower cost, but more importantly, it is very easy to use. You don't have to be a scientist uh, to be able to collect uh, this data. How does the data go from the box to your company, SafeCast? Uh, first of all, we're not a company. We're a volunteer organization, so let, let me be clear about that. How the data actually gets moved is very simple. It's like a camera. It has an SD card. After you have done uh, a drive for a couple of hours, you take the SD card out, you go to our website, you upload the file, and then you can see a map of your radiation that you have measured, and then we merge that with our database, and then people can uh, basically use a, um, uh, an application that we, for example, on, on a smartphone, uh, people can uh, uh, access, um, just a moment, they can, uh, they can then go to an, uh, an application on, on an iPhone or, or, or an iPad, and uh, I'll, I'll try to kind of zoom in to where we are right now in Tokyo, and as we're zooming in, I think you can see very nervous. you can see every single street, and you can see all the measurements we have done around that. And what are the measurements, for example? I mean, Tokyo is how many miles away from Fukushima? Um, we're about uh, two, 200 kilometers away from uh, Daiichi. Uh, as you can see on the map here, uh, we're here in Tokyo, and this is where Fukushima is. You can see there is a, a big difference uh, in up color. North coast. Yes, up, it's up around north. what 150 miles yes. um, up the coast. Yes, and how? toxic or radioactive is it here? Uh, compared to, um, uh, to, to the rest of, of Japan, Tokyo got a certain amount of fallout. Uh, <coughs> relatively speaking, I think the levels, uh, what they are today, are maybe 50% higher than what they were before the disaster. But compared to uh, uh, locations in Fukushima, it's actually relatively low. So in terms of you know, radi exposure to radioactivity, uh, this is nothing compared to what, what is happening in Fukushima Prefecture and, and areas around there. And you're taking this beyond the borders of Japan? Yes. Um, um, SafeCast started as a global organization. We got lots of help from outside of Japan. We would not be able to do it without all the volunteers. And we got lots of people outside of Japan have this, had the same worry, and they started to worry about it as well. And they're using the same equipment now to measure uh, their own uh, environments. We have people measuring, uh, lots of people measuring in the U.S. We have people measuring in Europe. We have some volunteers now in Africa. Uh, we have just covered all the seven continents in terms of having uh, the first measurements in, and that is spreading uh, very quickly right now. And how has the map in Japan changed? We're almost at the three-year mark, the third yes. anniversary of Fukushima. Yes. Um, if we look at radiation levels, uh, specifically in Fukushima area, we see that the radiation levels have dropped by about 40 to 50 percent, depending on where and how you measure. And that is uh, largely contributable to the half-life of some of the nuclides. And it is also contributed to the fact that the weather and the environment has specific ways of dealing with the material, and that has changed very slowly over time. You're also measuring air quality. Yes, we have started to uh, project to measure Beyond air quality. radiation. Yes, we got lots of interest in the radiation project, but lots of people came to us and said, please, can you do something about air quality? And uh, initially, we were too busy uh, solving uh, the problem of how do we measure radiation on a large scale, and we now have started to uh, a project to do that. On the issue of the state secrets law, how does it affect you? Uh, we believe that it should not affect us. We are actually collecting facts and data about our environment, and we strongly feel that that data should be public and open accessible. And you're saying you believe it shouldn't? It should, yes. Are you That's concerned that it will? Uh, I'm personally not concerned about that because I uh, uh, believe that that should not be an issue. However, how uh, that will be uh, reacted upon is something that we have to go and see. We don't Shouldn't know yet. Shouldn't the point. government be collecting this data and uh, sharing it with the citizens of this yes, country? Uh, absolutely. In the beginning of the disaster, the data uh, that was made available by the government was almost nothing. Uh, I think through uh, organ, or, you know, projects like Safecast, there has been lots of pressure to do more. 
Japanese government has been publishing more, TEPCO has been publishing more, uh, and, and doubtfully because there has been external pressure. Uh, however, lots, the problem we have with some of the data collection is it is very selective. Uh, and the other problem is, is lots of the data is available, but it is not open, so it is copyright protected. You can't download it and do something with it. It is restricted. The Japanese government says don't trust the information you have, um, that uh, it's very important to rely only on government readings. Uh, we strongly believe that in order to have credibility, you need to check your data. And uh, we at SafeCast, our goal is, is to uh, independently measure as citizens uh, if the data is correct or not. And the response of the corporation TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, that uh, runs the, owns the uh, nuclear power plants to what you're doing? Uh, we have never been contacted by TEPCO, so I can't really give a good <laughs> answer to that question. Well, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Um, if people want to find out more information uh, about this uh, SafeCast Geiger yes. counter. Yes, we, we have a website, safecast.org. Uh, if you go to our website, you can find more information about what we're doing and also how you can uh, build this device yourself and how you can participate in the SafeCast project. And the global mapping of radiation. Yes, anybody and anywhere quality. can participate. It's really easy. Peter Franken, thanks so much for being with us. More than 50 Japanese companies are pitching traditional Japanese food, or washoku, at a major gourmet food show in the United States. They're hoping to cash in on the cuisine that was listed as a UNESCO intangible cultural asset in December. The winter fancy food show began in San Francisco on Sunday. About 1,300 exhibitors from around the world are showcasing their special food and beverages. The fair is the largest of its kind held along the U.S. West Coast. It's drawing about 40,000 people in the industry. A record 56 Japanese food makers are participating this time. Wagyu beef, rice, and dried bonito for soup stock are among the items on display. There is the one ingredient that I'm very impressed with. It's like a hot pepper sauce, a Japanese hot pepper sauce, and I'm going to definitely use it. I'm going to go over to the booth and find out more about it. It's coming, it's frozen. Japanese food has become popular in major U.S. cities. The makers want the trend to spread to smaller cities where Japanese restaurants remain a pretty rare sight. Japanese officials are trying to stress the health benefits of Japanese food to American people at the show.